Welcome to Chapter 7 on Biogeochemical Cycles. For the last couple of weeks, we have been working on building up um, some expertise on chemistry, some basic chemistry, and also the different spheres of the Earth, like the hydrosphere, the lithosphere, the atmosphere, uh, several of those areas, so that we could delve into biogeochemical cycles. Review of this chapter, we will look at the Earth as a unique type of planet in our solar system. We'll also take a look at the life and global chemical cycles, and we'll just get an overview of biogeochemical cycles which will involve the geologic cycle and then some of the more major global biogeochemical cycles. We will not cover all possible uh, traces of chemicals throughout the different spheres. We'll concentrate on the main ones. So why do I say Earth is a peculiar planet? Well, part of it has to do with its four unique characteristics. As far as we know, uh, Earth is the only planet in our solar system that has water, and not, all, not only liquid water, I should say, but water at its triple point. In other words, water can exist uh, in all three phases, solid, liquid, and gas. We also look at the Earth in terms of plate tectonics. Now, more recently, we have seen with some of the... Um, the NASA missions to Pluto, there is some evidence there of plate tectonics. So we may not be so unusual in that respect. But as far as we know, life as we understand it only exists on the Earth. And what's critical about this, life here on Earth influences the different spheres, such as the hydrosphere, uh, the lithosphere, uh, the different areas like that. So life has an impact on biogeochemical cycling. Uh, the biogeochemical elements also have an effect on us as well. So it's a symbiotic relationship. So the question here, why does Earth have life and not the nearby planets? Keep this question in the back of your mind as we go through this particular lecture. So the planets near Earth. Uh, we all learned back back in elementary school there were nine planets. Now there are only eight. Pluto is no longer considered a planet, but for this particular lecture, we'll still keep Pluto uh, in our lecture. So basically, uh, the planets near the Sun, such as Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, uh, were basically formed by gravitational force. So all these different pieces of rock came together based upon the sun's gravitational pull to create the different planets. Now, you would think that Earth, Mars, Mercury, and Venus might have a similar atmosphere. Now, in the introduction of this chapter, the author gives an interesting scenario where an alien life form uh, comes flying in from outer space comes into our solar system and can see both Venus and Mars, but Earth at the time of their arrival is on the other side of the Sun. So if you haven't had a chance to read that yet, I would highly recommend it. So they begin to look at the atmosphere of Mars and Venus and would assume that if there was another planet in between Mars and Venus, it would have a similar atmosphere. Of course, we know that is not true and we'll learn why here in just a few minutes. So the fact that Earth's atmosphere is unique, the fact that it contains life, this has been termed environmental fitness. So in other words, life evolved in an environment conducive for that to occur. And also, the life itself altered the environment at a global level. That's that symbiotic relationship that I referenced earlier on. Well, let's talk about the rise of oxygen. Our earliest atmosphere, uh, currently I should say that roughly 79% of our atmosphere is made up of nitrogen, N2, the two atoms of nitrogen, and about 20% of oxygen and then a bunch of trace gases. 
Again, those are the permanent gases that I'm referring to. But before 2.3 million years ago, the Earth's atmosphere had very little oxygen. Now you're probably asking, how do we know that? As far as we know, none of us alive have been around 2.3 million years. Well, there's evidence. The Earth leaves evidence behind. And in fact, we see pyrite and sedimentary rock. So in other words, we see iron formations uh, in the Earth's rock formations. And basically what that tells us is the oceans were filled with dissolved iron. In other words, unoxidized. When we talk about oxidiza uh, oxidization, we're talking about elements reacting with oxygen present. And the fact that we have all of this pyrite and sedimentary rock shows us that we had unoxidized iron. Fe, the symbol for that. Now what happens when we oxidize iron? When we talk about the process of oxidization, we're talking about removing electrons from an element. In this particular case, I'm using the example iron. So for instance, if iron reacts with oxygen, it can form an iron oxide, or better known as rust. So the fact that we had the pyrite present shows us that there was not very much oxygen. However, once photosynthesis came about, and you remember photosynthesis is just simply the reaction of carbon dioxide and water in the presence of light, this being from the sun, which ends up creating carbohydrates plus free oxygen, or you can think of it as glucose, sugars, and free oxygen. So photosynthesis is a way to produce free oxygen. However, our atmosphere didn't all of a sudden become inundated with free oxygen because the first set of free oxygen elements actually had to oxidize all of the unoxidized iron. So all of that iron that was running around in the oceans had to be oxidized at first. And so therefore that early oxygen was not available for use in the atmosphere. Now let's take a look at some early organisms on Earth. We have two that we'll look at here briefly, prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And with prokaryotes, it was a rather simple cell structure. Uh, it did not have any organelles or a nucleus. Uh, it just required too much energy to maintain those two areas. So the question comes, where, where did the prokaryote come up with its energy? Well, it actually came up with energy through the process of fermentation. And this produced some energy, but again, it was a low energy yield. And the waste products you see there are CO2 and alcohol. It was a very simple structure. It lived singly by itself or end-to-end -end on chains. There were no three-dimensional structures to the pro prokaryote. However, with the eukaryote, it actually has a cell structure and organelles. And in fact, it would use oxygen for respiration, in other words, to create energy for the cell itself. And it can, or did, or does, form three-dimensional colonies of cells. So a, a structure that um, is a higher order functioning organism compared to the prokaryote. But again, the eukaryotes began to make the use of oxygen to help produce the energy of it. So, how did this actually become involved into the biosphere? Well, after the presence of both eukaryotes, uh, or I'm sorry, after the presence of eukaryotes and an oxygenated atmosphere, we began to see tremendous changes. We began to see plants and animals uh, come on the scene about 700 to 500 million years ago. And these more robust, higher order type of organisms began to have an impact on its environment. And we'll talk about that here soon. Now, before we go any further in terms of biogeochemical cycles, we need to talk about two types of nutrients, micronutrients and macronutrients.
Both of these types of nutrients are required for all life. Micronutrients, which we'll define here in just a moment, um, they're required in, required in small amounts uh, by all life, or in some cases, modern amounts by some forms of life. However, the macronutrients, these are the big ones. These are the ones that are required for all organisms to exist on Earth. Now, the ones that we'll look at are what we call the big six, which are basically the building blocks of life, such as carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And in fact, when we look at the biogeochemical process, we'll take a look specifically the uh, five elements, the first five elements that you see there. And like we said, each, each of these elements play a role in organisms. Now, this should look somewhat familiar to you, the periodic table. And you'll notice here that the elements such as hydrogen, potassium, calcium, uh, magnesium, manganese, iron, and so on are required for all life. Notice they're shaded in green here, and so they are required for all life. You see some of the dash shading that is required for some life forms, not necessarily all. And then you see the ones here in orange uh, can be dangerous. They're moderately toxic to organisms. And then the highly toxic elements, the highly toxic elements you see here in the dashed orange. Now, notice right here copper. Uh, you notice part of it's required for life, and part of it can be moderately toxic. So when we talk about life itself, the elements above that we talked about, especially the big six, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur, and we'll especially see the role that phosphorus plays in our uh, DNA structure, it plays a very key role. We'll learn about that here in just a little bit. But for life to exist and to persist, these elements must be available at the right time, in the right amount, in the, and in the right concentrations relative to other elements. Too much of, the, of some of these elements can be toxic. Too little uh, can limit growth and development. And neutral elements, some elements have no impact for life. Now, we only, only 24 elements are needed for life. And when we talk about the macronutrients, again, these are elements that are required in large amounts by all life. Ourselves, we are made up, we're a carbon-based unit. Uh, we need oxygen and nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, phosphorus for our uh, cellular structure, sulfur, hydrogen, all these things we need. And then, like I said, micronutrients smaller amounts by all life. Now, we finally get to the definition of biogeochemical cycles. And it's simply a cycle for elements, in other words, chemical elements, that moves through the four major reservoirs of planet Earth. We'll look at the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the lithosphere, and the biosphere. Now, some general aspects of biochemical cycles. Some actually move through systems, and again, remember we talked about Earth systems back, I think it was in chapter four. So when we take a look at each of these reservoirs, we're talking about a system, so the atmosphere system, the hydrosphere system, and so on. Now, some chemicals actually move through these systems rather quickly. And those that move through quickly typically have a gas phase and are soluble and carried by the hydrologic cycle. So two elements, oxygen and nitrogen, cycle through the hydrologic cycle rather quickly. And then there are other chemicals, uh, chemical elements, that are basically immobile. Um, they are returned over millions of years. They are cycled through. And we'll talk about that especially when we get to the lithosphere. So there are chemicals in the lithosphere that cycle in and out over millions of years. So they don't cycle. Their resonance time, you know, we've talked about resonance time, 
is on the order of millions of years. These type of elements, um, they lack a gas phase and are insoluble in any type of liquids. In this particular case, phosphorus is an example. So let's talk about some general aspects of biogeochemical cycles. Uh, most required nutrients are light. In other words, they're on the left-hand side of the uh, chart. The heaviest nutrient is iodine, which has an atomic weight of 53. And since the presence of life has made its appearance, it has altered how chemistry or how the chemicals will cycle through the different earth systems. And so the continuation of processes that control biogeochemical cycles is essential for the maintenance of life. So basically, if we were to stop the biogeochemical cycle, then we would not have the right amount of nutrients in the right concentration at the right time, which would have an adverse effect on life. Now, as we've moved into the modern ages, there have been changes to the transfer rate. In other words, the flux. That is a term where we talk about a rate of transfer per unit time. And so with the modern technology, such as the creation of fertilizers, is one thing that comes to mind. The transfer rates of elements into air, water, and soil have been altered. So the transfer of nitrogen into the soil, we'll talk a little bit about that later on. In some cases, it is a benefit to us, and in other cases, uh, it can be an environmental hazard. Uh, CO2 concentrations increasing over the last 60 years does give us some benefits, but also is a hazard as well. And we'll talk about that as we get further into the course. So we must recognize the positives and negatives of changing the biogeochemical cycle. Now, there is this box and arrow diagram, which is a simple um, visual representation of how elements cycle in and out of the different spheres. So the boxes are places where the chemical is stored. So if I look down here, I have box A and box B. And so box A, let's say it is a chemical being stored here. Uh, for instance, we can say like nitrogen. And flux is the rate of transfer. So you see right here, flux is the rate of transfer. In other words, the flow is the amount moving from one box to another. And we define the flux as the rate of that transfer. So we're transferring material. In this particular case, I think I use nitrogen as an example from Reservoir A, or Earth System A, to Earth System B. Okay, so it's moving the flux, the rate of transfer is moving from A to B. And A, in this particular case, is called the source, because it's providing the nitrogen. And the receiving compartment, compartment B in this example, is called the sink. It is the receiving. Now we can reverse these, box B, can also contribute to box A. And so the rate of transfer, the flux, is from box B to box A. So in this particular case, when the rate of transfer is going from right to left, then the source box is B, and the receiving box, or the sink box, is A. This is the simplest rate, or the simplest way of describing a, uh, a, a cycle, a biogeochemical cycle. The arrows themselves represent the direction or the pathway of transfer. Now, if we go down to B here, this is a little bit more complicated, but still quite simple. This is a very simple representation of the hydrologic cycle. So box A in this case is the atmosphere, box B is the lake, box C is the land. And so we know that we transfer water from all uh, between all three of these reservoirs. So for instance, from the atmosphere to the lake, or we could go atmosphere to the land. I'm not exactly sure why they don't have it drawn here as well. But for this case, they're keeping it pretty simple. So from the atmosphere to the lake, we have precipitation falling. And so that is a transfer 
of water in the liquid state into the lake. But we also know that there's this process called evaporation off of lakes. And so now the transfer of water, this time being in the gaseous stage, is from the lake to the atmosphere. So when we have evaporation being the process, the source is the lake, and the sink, the receiving, is the atmosphere. We also have runoff from the lake to the land, and also from the land to the lake. And so you can see how all three of these compartments or systems transfer water in liquid and gaseous state as well. So that's a very simple process of representing um, the box and arrow diagram of representing a biogeochemical cycle. In this particular case, we're talking about water. So uh, two atoms of hydrogen and an atom of oxygen, H2O. So we're transferring hydrogen and water. Uh, the compound itself is H2O, water molecules. Now, let's talk about the geologic cycle. When we talk about the geologic cycle, we're going to talk about rocks and soil and also the groups of cycle within the geologic cycle. So geologic, we're meaning the earth, earth cycle. So for rocks and soil, these things are continually created, destroyed, maintained, changed over the last almost four and a half billion years. These changes are due to physical, chemical, and biological processes, which we will define a little bit later. One physical process you see this on your roads at this time of year. When we begin to get the freezing and thawing of the roads across Iowa, you notice we begin to get these cracks in, uh, in the roads. Well, the same thing happens. Uh, this is what we call physical weathering, the change uh, due to freezing and warming of rocks. We'll also talk about chemical and biological processes later on. But what we're going to do is we're going to go through each one of these geologic cycles, the tectonic, hydrologic, rock, and biogeochemical. Now, this past week, uh, I gave you some brief study modules on tectonics, plate tectonics, so some of this should look familiar to you. So if we look at this particular uh, graphic here, this represents a biogeochemical cycle that takes in the hydrological cycle, hydrologic cycle. You see here you have water, you have evaporation being, so the flux is liquid water into gaseous form, which eventually go back into liquid form, what we call clouds. The clouds begin to move, they begin to precipitate, in other words they begin to dump water or rain onto the land, and then you begin to have some runoff here. So you see these little streams here, so the water begins to run back here. Some of it begins to infiltrate into the ground. Now, if we look at the ground itself, we have this tectonic cycle. We also have what we call divergent plate boundaries. In other words, this is how we begin to get new rocky materials. As the ocean floor begins to separate, diverge, you see the arrows here. So we begin to get new rock creation here underground and it, becomes, it begins to get buried. Uh, as it begins to bury, it begins to heat, compress. We talk, talk about that being the metamorphic phase. We get heating and melting, and it's transferred out through a volcano. And so you see a lot of things going on here. You see the rock cycle going on here in this schematic tube. But we'll talk more about it as we go through the process. But this is a very simplified version of what we would call the geologic cycle. So let's get to the tectonic cycle right away. So the tectonic cycle involves the creation and destruction of the lithosphere. We talk about that being about the first 60 miles of uh, Earth. So if we go from the surface down to about 60 miles down or 100 kilometers, uh, we call that the lithosphere. That is the outer layer of the Earth. And we also have movement of what we call plates, and we'll talk about that here in just a moment. Uh, 
the earth begins to move and it moves anywhere from 2 to 15 centimeters per year which would be about an inch to 6 inches per year the lithosphere is moving. Now when we talk about plate tectonics they make they are a major player in the production of rocks with the rock cycle. It plate tectonics in other words as plates begin to move they can change the location and the size of continents although on a very slow time scale these changes can also affect climate. Uh, one example that comes to mind when we have mountain ranges form and we'll talk about how mountain ranges form here in just a little bit but they can affect the immediate climate uh, for instance on the windward side of a mountain you would have precipitation on the leeward side of the mountain you would have a, derid, uh, a desert an arid type of climate it can also produce ecological islands and areas of volcanic activity and earthquakes so plate tectonics play a large role in the cycling of chemicals. There are two types of plate boundaries, there are actually three, uh, which we'll get to in the next uh, slide, but you have what we call divergent plate boundaries. In other words, these are plates that begin to move apart, and an example of that is at an ocean ridge where plates move in opposite directions. We have new lithosphere produced, this is known as seafloor sea spreading and produces ocean basins. Now some examples of divergent plate boundary can be found throughout the different continents. So for instance, if we look at the Eurasian plate, which is made up of all of this area here, and the North American plate, you notice that right here is where we have seafloor spreading, this solid blue line here and so the Eurasian plate is moving to the southeast and the North American plate is moving to the northwest. They are moving apart here what we call divergent and so a new lithosphere is produced here. Again keep in mind lithosphere is that area of the Earth's crust uh, to about 60 miles or 100 kilometers thick. So that's one example of what we call a divergent plate boundary. Now, plate boundaries also converge, and this, this occurs when they collide. And when we get heavier ocean plates, so the ocean plates are more dense than the continental plates, we have what we call a subduction zone is present. Now, when you get two lighter continental plates colliding, we get a mountain ridge may end up forming. So in other words, if we look down here, we have the Eurasian plate uh, colliding here with this plate here, and so we begin to develop the Himalayas. The Andes Mountains is another example of uh, converging plates, but actually what we have here with the Andes Mountains is we have an ocean plate colliding with a continental plate. So the South American plate and the Nazca plate are actually moving together and what ends up happening is that the ocean plate being more dense and heavier begins to subduct or move underneath the lighter continental South American plate and so that is a way that we can produce mountains there as well. Then we have what we call transform fault boundaries this is when boundaries basically move parallel to each other but in different directions. A really famous transform fault is the San Andreas Fault. So what ends up happening here, the Pacific Plate is moving to the northwest. The North American Plate is moving to the southeast. And so as you see up here, over millions of years, one day Los Angeles will be a suburb of San Francisco as the North American plate moves to the southeast and the San Andreas Fault moves to the northwest. So these are all ways of the tectonic cycle helping to produce rocks, minerals, 
And so what I'll do here is I'll po uh, pause for just a moment. I'm going to pull up a YouTube video on the tectonic cycle. The idea that our planet's continents drift around the globe, periodically glomming together and breaking apart, is at least 200 years old. But most geologists didn't believe it until the 1960s, when mounting evidence made it clear that the Earth's crust is broken up into fragments, and that those fragments, called tectonic plates, are moving. And these days we directly track that motion, with millimeter precision, from space. The common, simplified explanation for why tectonic plates are moving is that they're carried along on currents in the upper mantle, the slowly flowing layer of rock just below Earth's crust. Converging currents drive plates into each other, diverging currents pull them apart. This is mostly true. Hot mantle rock rises from the core and moves along under the crust until it grows cool and heavy and sinks back down again. But the plates aren't just passively riding these currents around like a bunch of suitcases at the baggage claim. They can't be, because some of the plates are moving faster than the currents underneath them. For example, the Nazca Plate, a chunk of ocean crust off the west coast of South America, is cruising eastward at about 10 centimeters per year, while the mantle underneath it oozes along at just 5. Neither tectonic plates nor luggage can move faster than the belts they're riding on unless something else is helping to push or pull them along. And some of Earth's plates, it turns out, are pulling themselves. When an ocean plate collides with another ocean plate, or a plate bearing the thick crust of continental landmasses, the thinner of the two plates bends and slides under the other. As the edge of the sea floor sinks into the mantle, it pulls on the plate behind it, the same way a chain dangling further and further off a table will eventually start to slide. The bigger the sunken portion of the plate becomes, the harder it pulls and the faster the remaining plate behind it moves. You can find where this is happening just by looking at Google Earth. The incredibly deep, narrow ocean trenches visible off the coasts of some continents and island chains mark the creases formed as ocean crust plunges downward, bending the edge of its neighbor in the process. What's more, these chunks of seafloor are actually helping to drive convection in the mantle beneath them. Sunken slabs of ocean crust block flowing rock from moving further sideways, forcing it to turn downwards and sink. And eventually, those slabs get too heavy and break off, plunging slowly toward the core and creating a suction force that pulls mantle material along behind them. So in some ways, seafloor crust is really more like part of the conveyor belt than something riding on top of it. The continents, on the other hand, are baggage. So let's now go to the hydrologic cycle. Uh, the hydrologic cycle is just simply the movement of water from oceans to the atmosphere, and atmosphere to the land, and back to the oceans. And Basically, the hydrologic cycle is driven by the difference in heating, specifically driven by the solar energy, energy provided by the sun during the day, and the earth at night, but more driven during the day. Um, this occurs based upon evaporation of water from oceans, and so once the incoming shortwave radiation from the sun hits the ocean, it begins to excite the molecules. The molecules break away from the surface of the ocean and become gaseous. And this is known as water vapor. Uh, after a while, that water vapor rises high enough, it will condense into a cloud. So it's went from gas back to liquid. And then processes within the cloud can help to create precipitation, which rains itself out on land or water. And then we've got the process called transpiration. That is a flux of water vapor. Again, a transfer of water from a plant to the uh, atmosphere. And again, transpiration means that we're moving water vapor, water in the gaseous state from the plant actually to the atmosphere. And what's kind of interesting about this, during the summertime, uh, specifically in July and August, our corn plants and our um, other crops such as soybeans are putting out so much water, in other words, they're breathing out water, uh, so much that we have higher than normal dew points in the state of Iowa compared to the rest of the uh, U.S. So you can actually see that on a weather map. Sorry about that. That is my son actually screaming uh, upstairs. Um, and then you have evaporation of water from land, not only from ocean, but from land. You have runoff from streams, rivers, and actually subsurface groundwater as well. So that is all being transferred around. Uh, you see the total water on Earth there, 
1.3 billion cubic kilometers. Uh, let's see if we put that in miles. Let, I'm doing the, the transition in my head here. 1.3, which would be about 7.8 billion cubic miles of water. And of that cubic miles, uh, 7 point, or 0.78, sorry, I should say 0.78 uh, cubic miles, 97% of that is from the oceans, 2% in glaciers and ice caps, and then the rest of the breakdown that you see there. So really, the biggest driver there are the oceans, uh, and you have smaller amounts in that below that. Hydrologic cycle can take place on a regional and local level. So, for instance, think about the Gulf of Mexico. That is, makes up a large region of the uh, southern U.S., so it's just off the tip of the southern U.S. Uh, that is a large source of uh, evaporation from a large water body. You also can have it at the local level. Uh, you go out to, what is it, Gray's Lake in Des Moines is an example where the Gray's Lake can actually um, impact the climate based upon how much water is being evaporated into the surrounding atmosphere. So the area that contributes surface runoff to a particular stream or river, these things vary greatly in size and usually named for the main stream or river. Here is an example, a very simplified example of the hydrologic cycle. Uh, this right here, the numbers of uh, 505, let me see. This is in terms of thousands of cubic kilometers. So the evaporation from water is 505,000 cubic kilometers, or it would be roughly 300,000 miles, cubic miles, of transfer of liquid water into the gaseous state. So as the winds begin to blow the clouds over land, it begins to rain out, and roughly 119,000 cubic kilometers per year of water is rained out from clouds you begin to have runoff, and you see here runoff uh, looks like 47, uh, 47,000 cubic kilometers per year of runoff from surface and subsurface. So you see subsurface, they're combining both the runoff from the surface and subsurface. You have regional uh, lakes, it looks like about 72,000 cubic kilometers of evaporation going up into the atmosphere. So, and then you have, let's see, we have 458,000 uh, cubic kilometers back into the ocean total on that. So you can see how this cycle begins. We get evaporation going up, clouds moving, precipitating out. 100, uh, you see precipitation hitting the surface. Some of, that, some of that water seeps into the subsurface, some of it in terms of runoff, and then you have subsurface water moving to ocean as well. And so this is a cycle. You have evaporation coming up from local lakes, from oceans. You have transpirations from the plants. You see here trees that shows the movement there as well. Again, this is a highly simplified model of the hydrologic cycle. Now I'm going to show you a video uh, from YouTube on the hydrologic cycle. All the water on Earth today, every drop, is all the water there has ever been on the planet. Fresh water is actually millions of years old, the same water flowing in a continuous loop, falling as rain and snow from clouds to the Earth's surface, running in rivers, pooling in ponds, 
flowing from faucets, irrigating crops, traveling through plants, generating power, eventually evaporating into the air and condensing into clouds again. Why is there life on Earth? And the reason there's life on Earth is because Earth has this perfect water cycle. The water cycle. So simple, even small children understand the basics. Yet so complex, the most advanced Earth scientists, hydrologists, geologists, and biogeochemists are studying every part and process. The water cycle is fascinating. It's something that's around us all the time. Um, and yet, we don't really understand it. How to summarize what is known about the water cycle? With two words, flows and stores. The water cycle is a series of flows of water between various water stores or storages. Clouds in the atmosphere. There's always a little bit of water in the atmosphere. We talk about relative humidity. It's a humid day, it's a dry day. Either way, there's water, sometimes a little, sometimes a lot. There's a lot of water in the ocean, 70% of all the water on Earth. In the ice sheets and glaciers, two-thirds of all the fresh water on Earth. In the snowpacks atop mountains like the Sierra Nevada. In the Great Lakes, in rivers and streams, in reservoirs and watersheds, in wetlands, in the soil, in and on plants and trees rooted in the soil, and beneath the soil in water tables and underground aquifers like the Ogallala High Plains, which runs underneath parts of eight states from South Dakota to Texas. All this storage is temporary. Water in all its forms is always in flux and always moving. And there is a name for every kind of movement in the water cycle, starting with precipitation. Precipitation is the process of water falling onto the surface of the earth. You can have precipitation in many forms, rain, snow, hail. Rain is falling water in liquid form. Snow, ice, hail, and sleet are falling water in solid or frozen form. Fog and mist, falling water in gas or vapor form. Precipitation that falls directly onto the oceans becomes part of surface ocean and can be churned by wave and wind action into ocean currents. Rain and snow that falls directly on rivers and streams becomes one part of stream flow. Rain that falls onto land takes a different path to the river, as does the snow and ice that falls and collects on mountaintops when temperatures warm. When snow melts, some of it runs through the snowpack and goes into um, small streams, tributaries that feed into large rivers. What about that precipitation that falls on and over land? Some is intercepted by vegetation, plants, and trees. Like you might imagine someone in, in the game of football intercepting a pass, these are raindrops trying to come to the ground and the leaves on the tree intercept them before they hit the ground. And the precipitation that does hit the ground? It can run off if the ground is hardscape, covered with asphalt or concrete, or if the soil is too wet or saturated to absorb more water like an over-soaked sponge. Otherwise, precipitation infiltrates the soil surface, percolates into the ground. Think of it as, as the water percolating through your coffee grounds in the morning. Gravity continues to pull it downwards so it will move through. Through the topsoil, or the spaces between soil and rock particles, down to bedrock and further into fractures, into deep underground aquifers. Even groundwater here is moving sideways or laterally, discharging toward a river, lake, or the sea. Generally, the deeper the flow, the slower the flow. Some of that fracture water might take a very long time, thousands to millions of years to get out. And how does water get back out into the atmosphere? It evaporates, is turned from a liquid into a gas or vapor by the heat of the sun. If you put a bit of water into a bowl and you set it outside on a sunny day, it's going to disappear. It's still water, it's just in the form of a gas rather than the form of a liquid. Water evaporates from every wet surface, even from wet air. Some rain and snow evaporates into the air while falling. Water evaporates through our respiration and perspiration. And from plants through transpiration. Trans means through or across plant roots draw groundwater. And plants pull that water up 
through their stems into their leaves and then release it back out through evapotranspiration. Evapotranspiration, a spelling bee worthy term for evaporation from soil and water services, plus transpiration from plants. Evaporated water molecules are tiny enough to flow into the air. Mixed with smoke and dirt particles in the atmosphere, cool, condense into visible masses of water vapor, clouds. Winds move clouds into colder air, water droplets collide and merge, grow bigger and heavier until they are so heavy they fall again, as rain or snow, sleet or hail. Precipitation, collection, runoff, interception, infiltration, percolation, discharge, transpiration, evaporation, condensation, the water cycle. Let us now move to the rock cycle. Rock cycle consists of numerous processes that can produce rocks and soils. We'll concentrate mainly on rocks here. It depends upon the tectonic cycle for energy and the hydrologic cycle for water. So you need both of those cycles to help in the production of the rock cycle. We have identified three rock types, igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic rock. And typically, igneous rocks are produced by um, molten lava that comes to the surface that begins to cool and solidifies. This we call igneous rock. Sedimentary rock, well, before I get into sedimentary rock, I should say that igneous rock is exposed to weathering. In other words, the breaking down um, of the rock itself. We talked about physical uh, and chemical types of processes to break down rock structure. Physical process we talked about earlier was the freezing and thawing of rocks, which helps to break up the rocks. The other type of process, chemical weathering, takes place whenever you have rain in the atmosphere. That creates a weak carbonic acid, and we'll talk a little bit about that when we get to the carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycle. But that also helps to break down this uh, igneous rock. And so what ends up happening, you have sediments that end up settling down um, in a valley or down under the ocean and they begin to form layers and these are layers of sediment that begin to get buried and compacted and eventually when compacted enough can form what we call a sedimentary rock and if that sedimentary rock is buried even further underneath the earth uh, the amount of force the amount of heating can change that sedimentary rock into a metamorphic rock. And in fact, you see, and again, this is a very simplified version, <coughs> simplified version of the rock cycle, but we can look at it in terms like this. <coughs> Pardon me, I've got a little bit of a cold going on here. But we begin to get a deposition of weathered rock uh, it begins to form into sediments, and the sediments begin to get compacted and form what we call sedimentary rock. The sedimentary rock begins to get buried and uh, will end up forming what we call a metamorphic rock, which is caused by intense heating and pressure. Now, the metamorphic rock can be um, thrown out to the surface through the um, volcanic type activity and it's thrown out to the surface and it's exposed to weathering and it forms sediments and then event eventually gets into a valley or into an ocean and begins to deposit and we start the process all over again. Also in terms of the metamorphic rock, further pressure and uh, heating can increase um, the rock again into a metamorphic rock. You see right here, when we go from metamorphic to igneous rock, these can go back and forth between the two different types of rocks. But all are eventually exposed to weathering and erosion. So it's quite a circular process, really interesting. Uh, here it talks about life, such as trees putting carbon in sediments. So in part, it helps to regulate the carbon cycle as well, and we'll talk about that here in just a little bit.
I've talked about the physical and weathering processes. I'm sorry, the physical and chemical weathering processes. Let's take a look at a short video on the rock cycle. Rock cycle. Rocks are the most common material on Earth. Some rocks are made up of just one mineral, while others are made up of two or more minerals. Rocks are constantly being formed worn down and then formed again. This is known as the rock cycle, though this cycle might take thousands and millions of years. Depending on their origin or formation, rocks can be mainly of three types. Igneous rocks, sedimentary rocks and metamorphic rocks. The word igneous means born of fire or heat. It is made when the molten magma from deep within the earth cools and turns it to solid rock. When the magma cools and hardens slowly below the earth's surface, they form intrusive igneous rocks. For example, granite. These rocks have larger crystals. When the magma gets over the surface and flows out as lava during a volcanic eruption, it cools down and hardens quickly to form extrusive igneous rocks. For example, lava rock or pumice. These rocks have smaller crystals. Forces of nature like wind, rain, heat, snow, ice together act on the exposed rocks on the earth's surface to gradually erode, weather and transport the broken bits. Old mountains are specially subjected to this slow gradual erosion. Broken bits are carried down by rivers and streams as sediments. When the water slows down enough, the sediments settle down at the bottom of lakes and oceans. Over many years, layers of these sediments pile over each other to be cemented together and hardened to form sedimentary rocks. Most rocks found on the Earth's surface are sedimentary rocks. For example, sandstone, limestone and shale. Sedimentary rocks often contain fossils in them. With layers of sediments piling up on top, dead animals and plants settle at the bottom. They get compressed to eventually turn into fossil fuels. Metamorphic rocks are those that change form due to the application of tremendous heat and pressure. When the Earth's crust moves, it causes rocks to get squeezed so hard that the heat causes the rocks to change. Also, extreme pressure under many thousands of feet of bedrock can crush the rock to form a metamorphic rock. Metamorphic rocks are originally igneous or sedimentary rocks which have transformed due to great heat or pressure. For example, the sedimentary rock limestone metamorphoses into marble and igneous rock granite changes into nile. Each of the rock types that is igneous, sedimentary and metamorphic can be recycled into the other. These dynamic transitions occur through geologic time. Igneous metamorphic or sedimentary rock can be eroded and weathered down into smaller fragments and carried away as dissolved material. Over time, the fragmented materials accumulate, get buried by additional materials and are cemented into sedimentary rocks. Igneous sedimentary or metamorphic rocks exposed to high temperatures or pressures can be changed physically or chemically to form a different rock called metamorphic rock. When sedimentary, metamorphic or igneous rocks are pushed deep under the earth's surface, they may melt into magma. This magma, when cooled, solidifies into an igneous rock. Erosion is a key part of the rock cycle. Erosion happens mainly 
as a result of weathering, which is the effect of water temperature and wind on the landscape. Water causes much erosion. Acid rain, chemicals in the air combined with precipitation, dissolves certain rocks that are sensitive to acid. Certain rocks that are soluble in water dissolve when they come in contact with ground water. Heavy rains, floods and fast moving rivers break away and carry rocks. Similarly, waves on the beach continuously smash against the rocks, causing them to crumble gradually. Glaciers pick up large rocks and scrape bedrock while moving down its course. The freezing and melting of ice causes cracks on the mountain. These cracks widen and crumble with repeated freeze and thaw cycle over a period of time. Wind as an agent of erosion is usually effective in dry desert-like areas. It blasts away layers of rocks, carrying them as it blows. Earth's crust is composed of tectonic plates, which are constantly moving at a very slow rate. However, when these plates collide, it causes friction, and this generates tremendous heat. This causes the rocks to continuously recycle and change from one form to another. Also, the Earth's internal heat and pressure causes the rocks to metamorphose, causing them to crumble under pressure or crystallize. Metamorphosis can occur in rock when they are heated to 300 to 700 degrees Celsius. The characteristic of a rock is also an important factor that contributes to the rock cycle. Softer rocks tend to break up easily. Falling rocks along a cliff also causes other rocks to break. Soil containing chemicals reacts with some rocks, changing them from one form to another. Also, plants seeking nutrients from soil and growing bigger tend to crack the rocks. The rock cycle continues. New rocks are formed and are changed from one form to another. Any given rock can undergo any part of the cycle any number of times. And this rock cycle never stops. <coughs> okay, let's move on to a cycle that you're probably pretty familiar with. You've heard it before, the carbon cycle. Um, Carbon is the element for us. It is an important element that anchors all organic substances or all living substances. Carbon actually has a gaseous phase. It enters the atmosphere through carbon dioxide and methane, and this occurs through respiration, fires, and diffusion. Anytime we talk about diffusion, we're talking about an area of greater concentration of carbon to less concentration of carbon. We're also talking about the chemical diffusion uh, of carbon, which we'll talk about here in just a moment. The actual carbon is removed from the atmosphere by photosynthesis. Keep in mind that plants uptake CO2 and water to make... Um, carbohydrates and free oxygen. So that is a sink. When we talk about uh, CO2 or methane, we're talking removed from the atmosphere, we're talking about a sink. The carbon cycle occurs in oceans in several different forms. Dissolved CO2, uh, once it is in ocean water, can break down into carbonate and bicarbonate and also marine organisms uh, and their products uh, make, uh, take carbon out by the process of calcium carbonate. They make their shells from that. It enters the ocean by diffusion and then dissolves and it transfers from land and rivers as dissolved carbon. Carbon can also be carried by wind as well. <coughs> 
Carbon enters the life cycle through photosynthesis and then returned by respiration or fire. When organisms die or there's decomposition of anything that has carbon in it, which means everything living, carbon is actually released. And one of the things that has been mentioned in terms of global warming is that as we begin to melt the polar ice caps, a lot of the um, organisms that existed underneath that ice cap uh, will now be able to give up its carbon to the atmosphere. So that's one theory of carbon being released into the atmosphere as, uh, as CO2. If we bury it, like I was saying, and under certain conditions, carbon is not released. Sometimes it's transferred, transformed into fossil fuels. Now let's talk about, again, this is a simplified version of CO2 sources and sinks. And there's a lot going on in this, so let's start off here with the ocean. And this is in gigatons of carbon per year. So gigatons, that's uh, a billion, gigatons of carbon per year. So we're talking about through oceanic photosynthesis and respiration, uh, about 90 gigatons of carbon per year uh, are released and returned to the ocean. We have uh, here, it looks like the units here for storage in ocean waters. These units are in billions of metric tons of carbon, like I was saying, gigatons of carbon per year. 38,000 um, metric tons of carbon per year. Now, notice this asterisk here, and it also talks about uncertainties, plus or minus 20%. So we talked about, in chapter one, we talked about scientific measurements and a value scientific uncertainties. This number here, 38,000, is plus or minus 20%. So we, haven't, we don't have a great handle on what is actually stored in the oceans. Let's see, from the land, photosynthesis and respiration gives up uh, 120,000 gigatons of carbon per year. Land use also takes in 1.6 gigatons per year and also releases that much. <coughs> when we talk about land use, we talk about uh, removing forest. When we remove forest, either through burning uh, or chopping down, we are releasing carbon into the atmosphere. Also, when we plant forest, uh, new forests actually serve as a sink for carbon from the atmosphere, so it would take in carbon from the atmosphere. Volcanoes, roughly uh, a tenth of a gigaton per year of carbon is released into the atmosphere. Burning fossil fuels, about 6.5 gigatons of carbon per year are released to the atmosphere. The soil is another storage place or a sink for carbon. You see right there 1,580 gigatons of carbon per year. But again, there's that asterisk. We don't have a great feeling. That could be 1580 uh, plus or minus 20%. So if we have 1600, we'll make the math easier, uh, times 0.2. Uh, that could be almost up to 20,000 gigatons per year or as little as 12,000 gigatons per year. Again, fossil fuels such as oil and coal also uh, is a sink or a storage reservoir for um, carbon as well. And then you have diffusion into the water and out of the water, but we just don't have a really good handle on that. So there's a lot of uh, release of carbon and a lot of intake. So the ocean is a large source of release and taking in of carbon. Land use also is another one. Photosynthesis and respiration. Storage in land in plants. Uh, about 700 gigatons per year, but again, that's plus or minus 20%. Weathering and erosion is about a half a ton, gig gigaton per year of carbon as well. Now, if we look even further down into a specific uh, area, let's say we have this lake here with surrounding land, we see that the fish, uh, the plants, 
the uh, the organisms, the biological organisms here, release and take in CO2. So let's just start off here with the easiest part, the interface between the water surface and the surrounding air. So whenever there's a difference in CO2, carbon dioxide moves out of the ocean or out of the water and into the water as well. Same thing here from dissolved sediments. We talked about sedimentary rocks uh, just, uh, just before. But when you have uh, carbon uh, can be dissolved from sediments or deposited into them. The dead animals uh, release CO2. The fecal pellets that live fish also transfer carbon to sediments as well. Carbon can be transferred by larger fish eating smaller fish, smaller fish eating smaller organisms, it's a way that CO2 is moved around uh, from the different biota that we see here. Now let's talk about the carbon silicate cycle. And uh, actually before we do that, let me show you a brief YouTube video on the carbon cycle. <laughs> Carbon is the basic building block of life, and these unique atoms are found everywhere on Earth. Carbon makes up the Earth's plants and animals, and carbon is also stored in the ocean, the atmosphere, and the crust of the planet. A carbon atom could spend millions of years moving through the Earth in a complex cycle. Understanding the carbon cycle and how it is changing is key to understanding Earth's changing climate. On land, plants remove carbon from the atmosphere through photosynthesis. Animals eat plants and either breathe out carbon or it moves up the food chain. When plants and animals die and decay, they transfer carbon back to the soil. Moving offshore, the ocean holds huge amounts of carbon, about 50 times the amount we find in the atmosphere. The ocean is sometimes called a carbon sink, meaning that it absorbs or takes up carbon from the atmosphere. It takes up carbon through physical and biological processes. At the ocean surface, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere dissolves into the water. Tiny marine plants called phytoplankton use this carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. Phytoplankton are the base of the marine food web. After animals eat the plants, they breathe out the carbon or pass it up the food chain. Sometimes phytoplankton die, decompose, and are recycled in the surface waters. Phytoplankton can also sink to the ocean floor, carrying carbon as they descend. Over long time scales, this process has made the ocean floor the largest reservoir of carbon on the planet. Most of the ocean's nutrients are in cold, deep water. In a process called upwelling, currents bring nutrients and carbon up to the surface. Carbon can then be released as a gas back into the atmosphere, continuing the carbon cycle. By cycling huge amounts of carbon, the ocean helps regulate climate. So when you think of climate, you don't often think of the ocean. You know, climate, you think of, is it going to be hotter this year? Is it going to be colder this year? But the oceans are actually a, a great regulator, a controller of the Earth's climate. And they even are controlling how much carbon is in the atmosphere, which can slow down how quickly climate change is occurring. At the most basic level, the balance between incoming sunlight and outgoing heat determines the Earth's climate. Greenhouse gases act like a blanket and trap heat in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. In the past two centuries, humans have increased atmospheric carbon dioxide by more than 30% by burning fossil fuels and cutting down forests. The Earth has not experienced carbon dioxide levels this high for the past several million years. Researchers are learning that future climate change will depend on carbon levels in the land, in the atmosphere, and in the sea 
and how these levels respond to human disturbance. About one third of all human generated carbon emissions has dissolved in the ocean. More than 80% of Earth's added heat is now stored in the ocean. In the future, as the planet gets warmer, the water is going to warm up, and warm water can hold less carbon than cold water. The other thing is, on a warmer planet, some of the currents are going to slow down, and so we might not be forming as much of this cold deep water. So we won't be able to transport carbon into the deep sea. So on the whole, the ocean is going to become less effective at removing carbon from the atmosphere. Throughout most of Earth's ocean, the warmer water, weaker circulation, and new temperature gradients that result from climate change will impact marine life and ecosystems. These changes affect the ocean's ability to store carbon. Increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere impacts marine life in other ways. As the ocean absorbs more carbon dioxide, it becomes more acidic, and this can be a threat to some of the organisms that live inside the ocean. As Earth's climate continues to change, how will researchers monitor something as big as the ocean and something as complex as the carbon cycle? NASA Earth observing satellites give scientists the big picture view of our home planet. Varied satellites help researchers detect changes in ocean climate and ecology over time, providing vital insight into the health of our home planet. Let's now talk about the carbon silicate cycle. You notice we've talked about the carbon cycle in uh, previously. Now we're, we notice that with carbon it moves through the atmosphere and through the hydrosphere rather rapidly. It can uh, move through in the gaseous state, so its resonance time is short. But when we talk about the carbon silicate cycle, we're talking about a cycle of at least a half a million years. So we're talking about a long-term cycle of carbon. And so what ends up happening, and it would just be easier if I just show you the graphic, is that we have CO2 present in the atmosphere. And whenever we get precipitation occurring, the H2O re reacts to the CO2 present and forms a mild uh, acid, mild carbonic acid that we call H2CO3. So this mild carbonic acid actually falls to the ground and it goes into onto the ground and it also actually percolates into the interior of the surface where eventually it will reach silica rocks and when this H2CO3 reaches the uh, silica rocks a further reaction occurs and now we have a breakdown into calcium uh, ions and a bicarbonate ion. This HCO3- minus is a uh, bicarbonate and the calcium ion. So they're broken up, they are transported into the ocean and now we've got calcium and uh, bicarbonate in the ocean Marine organisms will go in and go after the calcium and the bicarbonate to help produce their shells, their calcium carbonate shells, which is CaCO3. So they take this calcium ions and the bicarbonate and form their shells into uh, calcium carbonate, CaCO3. Well, what happens when these marine organisms die, they settle down to the bottom of the ocean, and as the... Uh, we talked about plate tectonics as the lithosphere is continuing to move this way and the let's say the ocean encounters a continental landmass then we begin to subduct or sink these calcium carbonate shells and we further move them deeper into the ground where pressure and heating will help to release it in terms of magma and then another chemical reaction happens to where now CO2 is freed up and also oxygen although not shown here but CO2 is freed up and we see it with erupting volcanoes 
moving up and so now we have CO2 back into the atmosphere. So there's the cycle of the carbon silicate cycle. Now that's a very simplified version of it but that's a good way to start. Okay, let's visit the nitrogen cycle. As you know, nitrogen basically makes up 78% of our atmosphere, 78, 79%, depending upon which textbook you look at. However, nitrogen in its molecular form, N2, is uh, very unreactive. Um, so in other words, organisms, biological plants, really can't do anything with uh, the nitrogen molecule in its form of N2. So something has to happen to transfer N2 into something that can be used. And what you see right here is NO3. It's uh, an ion. It's a, a nitrate ion and an ammonium ion. Those are things that can be used by plants and uh, animals and those types of things. But to do that, to change it from N2 into nitrate or ammonium, there has to be a catalyst. And in this particular case, it's performed by bacteria. So we have this uh, definition called nitrogen fixation. And that's whenever bacteria converts nitrogen into, that should be into there, to nitrate or nitrite, it can do that also, NO2 minus, or ammonium. The term denitrification is the reverse of the process. So we take nitrate or ammonium and turn it back into N2, and that can be done as well. So almost all of us depend upon nitrogen converting bacteria. And in fact, this is really kind of cool, is that there's a symbiotic relationship between the roots of plants uh, with this type of process, and also in the stomach and animals. And in fact, if you look at plants, down in the roots of plants, there are these little nodules uh, that are present where bacteria can take uh, molecular nitrogen and convert it into a useful process for uptake. We also, industrial processes, can convert uh, the molecular nitrogen into compounds such as nitrogen fertilizers. However, the issue there is that anytime we have any runoff, it is a potential source of pollution. We also can have nitrogen combining with oxygen at high temperatures. In other words, lightning strikes that would provide oxides of nitrogen, but they are a source of pollution there. So let's take a look at this particular uh, graphic. <coughs> There's a lot going on here. Uh, let's start off over here. We see on the right-hand side nitrogen fixation by bacteria. So that's where we take molecular nitrogen and turn it into ammonium. So we can turn it into a NH3. Uh, denitrification, also done by bacteria, is to take nitrate, NO3, or NO2 nitrite ion, and we can turn it back into molecular oxygen. So that's the nitrogen and denitrification process. But you see basically right here is that we have nitrogen fixation by bacteria, sea sprays involved into this. There's denitrification from the land surface as well, going back into uh, nitrogen. There's also the roots here called the internal cycling. So we look at the roots of the tree. They actually take N2 and convert it into useful products such as nitrates NO3- minus or ammonia uh, NH3- minus as well. We see also industrial fixation. Human activities can also lead to this as well. Notice that organic nitrogen there's quite a bit involved there, which helps make the soil very fertile. So let me go ahead and show you a brief video on nitrogen fixation.
The nitrogen cycle is probably the most difficult chemical cycle to understand because there are just so many different forms of nitrogen and there are a lot of processes you need to remember that convert nitrogen from form to form. Let's just take it a step at a time. We start with the atmosphere, which consists of 80% nitrogen gas. So it is the main reservoir for nitrogen in the form of N2. Nitrogen enters the um, ecosystem through a type of bacteria called nitrogen-fixing bacteria, which can be found in one of two places. So the first place it can be found is in particular types of plant roots, and these bacteria allow these plants to directly utilize nitrogen as a nutrient for growth. The second place nitrogen-fixing bacteria can be found is in the soil, and these nitrogen-fixing bacteria perform a process called ammonification, which turns N2 into NH4+, otherwise known as ammonium. So once N2 is converted into NH4+, a different type of bacteria kicks in, and this bacteria is called nitrifying bacteria, and this turns NH4+, into NO2-, minus, otherwise known as nitrites. This process of conversion is called nitrification. So to get yourself straight between nitrifying bacteria and nitrogen fixing bacteria, think about how nitrogen fixing bacteria sounds similar to carbon fixing bacteria, carbon dioxide fixing bacteria. So we talked a little bit about this briefly in the carbon video. And what carbon fixation is, is when plants um, perform photosynthesis, they take CO2 gas and fixate it into another form of carbon that's a solid. So, for example, glucose. And nitrogen fixation is pretty much the same thing. It's taking nitrogen in the form of gas and converting it into a solid. So it's turning nitrogen gas into ammonium. So if you remember, fixate means turning gas into solid you should be able to set yourself straight between nitrogen fixing and nitrifying bacteria. Okay, here is where it gets even more crazy because once ammonium turns into nitrite, more nitrifying bacteria turns nitrite into nitrates. Holy guacamole, what is the difference between nitrites and nitrates and how on earth do you remember the difference? So first of all, don't panic and let's look at the chemical conversion. Nitrites, NO2 minus, are converted into nitrates, NO3 minus. So here's a really silly trick that might help you remember the difference. Nitrites have two different types of vowels, I's and an E. And so in its chemical formula, it has a two. Nitrates has three different vowels, an I, an A, and an E. So nitrates have a three in their chemical formula. This actually works for ammonium too if you're having a problem remembering the chemical formula for ammonium. Ammonium has four different vowels, A, O, I, and U. And so it has a four in its chemical formula. And then if you need to remember the order of nitrites and nitrates, remember two always comes before three. So nitrites always come before nitrates. Okay, now that we sort of have that settled, we can move on to the next part of the nitrogen cycle. So after nitrogen is converted into nitrates, there are two possibilities, and one is assimilation. And this is when nitrates end up being absorbed into plant roots and used in plants for their nutrients. And in this part of the cycle, after assimilation, the plants are, can then be eaten by different animals. Um, so the nitrogen is passed to these animals. And both the plants and the animals, when they decompose, um, can add nitrogen back into the soil and then decomposers such as bacteria and fungi <coughs> convert this nitrogen content back into ammonium and it restarts the cycle from ammonium. The second path that the nitrogen cycle can take after nitrates 
is um, back to the atmosphere. So this, in this case, you need denitrifying bacteria. You can think D is kind of like undoing what we did in the nitrogen cycle so far. So it's kind of like reversing the process. And it finishes up the cycle by uh, taking nitrates, NO3 minus, and converting it back into nitrogen gas. So this completes the nitrogen cycle. A really quick summary, nitrogen goes from N2 through nitrogen fixing bacteria into NH4 plus, through nitrifying bacteria into NO2 minus, again through nitrifying bacteria into NO3 minus, and then back through denitrifying bacteria into N2. Okay, the last cycle we'll talk about is a very important one. It's called the phosphorus cycle, and it's one of the big six that we talked about, one of the uh, macronutrients from earlier. Uh, a lack of phosphorus or uh, the, the incorrect amount of phosphorus is often a limiting factor for growth in both plant and algae. Uh, phosphorus itself, unlike nitrogen and oxygen, does not have a gaseous phase. So the rate of transfer of phosphorus is very slow. Um, the phosphorus cycle itself enters the biota through uptake as phosphate by plants, algae, and some bacteria. It returns to soil when plants die or is lost to oceans by runoff and returned to land uh, via ocean feeding birds excrement called guano. And in fact, that's what you're looking at right here is guano that has hardened for many, many years of deposits by birds there. So guano itself is a major source for uh, phosphorus or fertilizers. Uh, phosphorus mining creates some problems because an overabundance of phosphorus that gets into water, both surface water or subsurface water, can cause pollution problems. Uh, such as unwanted growth of photosynthetic bacteria and algae, uh, which ends up taking up all of the oxygen. Uh, oceanic dumping of organic materials high in nitrogen and phosphorus has produced these dead zones. Uh, again, it just it takes up all of the oxygen and it becomes an oxygen-free environment. So what I thought we'd look at right here is this particular schematic of phosphorus. You'll notice here that we have boxes and circles and boxes themselves um, <coughs> pardon me represents uh, stored amounts okay hard to move in millions of metric tons. The circular ones represents flows in millions of metric tons per year. So if we start off with the boxes, we see that phosphorus, the mineable phosphorus, is about 15,000 uh, metric tons. Uh, we also look at the Earth's crust. Look at that, 20 billion uh, metric tons there. Let's see if we can find any more boxes. Oh, ocean sediments, uh, 100, uh, looks like 100 million there. Marine biota, marine life, stored 200 million metric tons there. You see guano, birds, and islands. Now some of the flow represented by the ovals, we see soil to fresh waters. <coughs> Pardon me. We see 10 million of met uh, metric tons there. Uh, let's see fertilizer uh, coming from plants, 22 there. Erosion, 30. Industrial waste and urban environments uh, represent 3 million metric tons. Fresh water, um, tectonic uplift, we talked about that, 20 million metric tons there. Oceans themselves, 95,000, again that's what is stored. So we're going to see here why phosphorus is so important. I mentioned earlier it has to do with um, the DNA in our body. So phosphorus is a critical component uh, 
So I've got a YouTube video here that sheds a little bit more light on that. Okay, so in this video, we're going to look at the phosphorus cycle. Now, one thing I want to mention is that even though phosphorus cycles through the environment, there is no phosphorus in the atmosphere. So it's not like the carbon cycle where there's carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's not like the nitrogen cycle where there's nitrogen in the atmosphere. The phosphorus cycle begins with rocks, and we're going to go through that in just a moment. Well, first of all, why do we need phosphorus? Well, phosphorus, if you recall, is one of the, uh, one of the atoms that makes up the molecule called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. In the picture here, here's a mitochondria, and through the process of cellular respiration, the mitochondria will make this molecule, adenosine triphosphate. You can see there are P's for phosphorus in the diagram. Another important molecule that, that requires phosphorus is DNA, not just DNA, but RNA, nucleic acids. So here's a double helix. Now, if we, if we look at the molecular structure of DNA, remember that DNA is made from small parts called nucleotides. And you can see the nucleotide is a sugar molecule, a nitrogen base, and then a P, the P stands for a phosphate molecule. The reason it's called phosphate is there's phosphorus in it. And one nucleotide combined with another, with another, with another, like you see in the picture, makes up DNA, a nucleic acid. So DNA, the genetic heredity, the genetic molecule of life, it requires phosphorus. And a third reason why phosphorus is really important in the animation here, we have a phospholipid bilayer. Basically, we have the cell membrane of all of our cells. A phospholipid, phospho implies there's phosphorus in the lipids that make up the cell membrane. Well, let's go ahead and get on into the stages of the cycle now. So here we have an, a, a rain cloud and it's raining. And so what we're going to show you is really the first stage of the phosphorus cycle. And it comes from the breaking down and the weathering of rocks. You know, rocks are just lumps of minerals, and one of the minerals that rocks are commonly made from is phosphorus. And so when it rains, uh, phosphorus, little chips of, of rocks break off and crack and crumble, and this is what we mean by the weathering of rocks. And so phosphorus is released as rocks weather and break down and erode. And the phosphorus has now entered the soil. Well, once the phosphorus is in the soil, now it becomes pretty straightforward. The flowers representing the producers in this animation will absorb the phosphorus through their roots. And once the phosphorus is in the roots of plants, I hope you can figure out how animals can obtain the phosphorus. So now that the phosphorus is in the plants, the phosphorus simply moves up the food chain. In our animation, we have phosphorus going from the flowers to the snail. Well, that's because snails eat leaves and flowers and plants. In the next part of the animation, we have phosphorus going from the snail into the frog. Well, that's because frogs can eat snails. Phosphorus is simply moving up the food chain. And then we come to area four represented by our mushrooms in the animation. It says decomposers will obtain phosphorus as they feed on dead remains. In the animation, there's a pea coming from the flowers, there's a pea coming from the snail, and there's a pea coming from the frog. And they're all going to the mushrooms, representing the decomposers. I'm not implying that mushrooms hunt frogs and snails and flowers, but when frogs and snails and flowers die, their dead remains, which still contain phosphorus, are fed on by decomposers such as fungus, decomposers such as bacteria. Well, if we notice here, also there is a pea coming out of the mushroom because, again, all organisms give off waste. And fungus and other decomposers will give off phosphorus in their waste. And so if you just pause and look at the animation, we have a cycle here. We have a continuous loop of phosphorus throughout the ecosystem, throughout the environment. Well, there's one little twist I want to add to this before the video is finished. We have to focus on the human contribution to the phosphorus cycle. So humans will often use fertilizers, and, and phosphorus is a very common ingredient, as well as nitrogen. 
phosphorus and nitrogen are very common to fertilizers. Well, we add fertilizers to help our crops and plants grow better. And so here we have a picture of a farmer using a tractor and pulling a, a trailer that is dispensing fertilizers over their crops. And so the problem with this is that the phosphorus, when it's sprayed on the crops, will often run off with rain into bodies of water. So in this picture right here, you can see that water is running off of this farm. And so often the, the fertilizers are simply being carried away with this rainwater here. So in my animation here, here we have a farmer adding peas, uh, a bunch of peas for phosphorus. So the, the farmer's adding phosphorus to their crops, to the plants. And so they're fertilizing, the farmer's fertilizing the crops. Well, unfortunately, the phosphorus that's accumulating in the animation won't just stay there. Often the phosphorus is carried with weather and rain. So when it rains, when it rains, often the phosphorus is simply carried downstream or down river or down, down the slope of the land. And you can see in the animation, the phosphorus is accumulating in this body of water. Well, this is uh, going to lead to another problem. This is, often causes what are called algal blooms, an extreme growth of algae in the animation. You see the water in the pond is turning green because of all the algae that is now uh, being stimulated to grow from all the phosphorus. Phosphorus is a fertilizer. It stimulates the growth of algae as well as stimulating the growth of crops. Well, why is this bad? Well, first of all, before we address why is that bad, here's a couple of uh, photographs of algal blooms. You can see this watery area is just has a layer of green slime growing on it. And here we have a, a, a lake or a river that's completely been turned green because of the extreme growth of algae. Well, what, uh, the problem that this causes is something called eutrophication. Oft, often and ultimately what happens to this little body of water, it becomes a dead zone. The algae is so dense and so thick, it will often block sunlight to plants that live deeper in the water and they start to die. Often, oh, the next step that happens is the algae themselves will begin to die and bacteria will feed on the dead remains of the algae. Well, the bacteria are using all of the oxygen in the water to break down and, and, and decompose the algae that the, the water almost becomes oxygen, oxygenless. It becomes void of oxygen because the bacteria are using it all. So therefore, snails die, fish die, organisms, other animals that live in this water begin to die because there's no oxygen. The extreme growth of algae often causes the pH of the rivers and the lakes to change, and so that's another reason why uh, the lake can become a dead zone. So the point is, is that the phosphorus cycle is out of balance, and you know human contributions are some of the reasons for that. So if you're if you have a bit of a green thumb at home and you're interested in landscaping and gardening, you know perhaps you can go down to um, you know, a, 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 the local supply store and look for safer, uh, non-chemical ways to perhaps fertilize your lawn and fertilize your garden. Okay, let's just take a moment to summarize uh, Chapter 7, uh, Biogeochemical Cycles, or the way we move elements through the different compartments, such as the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the lithosphere, and biosphere. And we can think of biogeochemical cycles as a series of reservoirs and pathways between reservoirs, just like we talked about the box and arrow uh, simplification that we used earlier uh, in this video. Some elements, especially those in the gaseous state, uh, cycle through uh, these reservoirs rather quickly. Um, however, some that don't have a gaseous phase take a little bit longer. Uh, such as the phosphorus cycle. Um, we also talked about, uh, what was the other one that we talked about? Oh, the silicate, the carbon silicate, the silicate side of it as well. Uh, we know that life on Earth has been altered by biogeochemical cycles, and life itself uh, has been altered uh, by biogeochemical cycles. It's a symbiotic relationship. We know that every living thing requires a number of chemical elements. We talked about 
uh, the 24 macronutrients that all living organisms need. These uh, chemicals must be available at the appropriate time and in the appropriate form. These chemicals can be reused and recycled, but some elements are lost over time and must be replenished. We also mentioned briefly about modern technology has been used to alter and transfer chemical cycles. We've talked about nitrogen uh, being one of those, CO2 being another one as well. Uh, some are beneficial, like we said, in terms of nitrogen fertilizers. Uh, however, uh, many are harmful by adding to water pollution. And also, when we're talking about the nitrogen cycle, the nitrous oxide is also an air pollutant. Uh, that is an issue as well. Uh, these cycles are complex. What I've presented here this evening and what others have presented with the YouTube videos is a very simplified version of the cycle. Uh, the Earth's biota itself has greatly altered the cycling of these chemicals through each of the different reservoirs. The continuation of this cycling of chemicals is, is essential to the long-term uh, maintenance of life on Earth. Uh, there are many uncertainties. You notice when we were talking about the carbon cycle specifically, there was a plus or minus 20% uh, in terms of the amount present, like in the ocean. So again, there's still much work to be done with that to determine the final rates that are actually available. And finally, understanding the cycles more completely will help us better to understand our environment and how to properly take care of it uh, for now and the future. In other words, making it sustainable, pulling a term out of earlier this semester. So I hope you found this section on biogeochemical cycles interesting and have a good day.